Tá certo. Uh, primeira coisa, thank you both for being here. I would like you first, Alex Limi, to introduce yourself briefly. I know that you have a long life history. No, I'm not. Honestly, I, I'm counting on it because Sorry. I have like five questions and uh, we have one hour. So excellent. So, so yeah. Uh, so I'm Alex Limi. Um, my Portuguese is pretty terrible, so let's not do that. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I made it in Copeland way back when. Um, then went went on to do some stuff with uh, Google and Firefox and a video conferencing company. No, nothing really relevant to this conversation, but uh, yeah. So glad to be here. Nice to meet you guys where finally. So, oh, where I'm from originally, uh, I'm from Norway. So that's half of where Plon came from. And uh, we've had a, a lot of sprints there. I'm sure we'll get into that. So. Uh, thank you very much. It's kind of strange speaking English in front of a Brazilian audience. But I, no, we actually we are in front of a world audience. Yes, OK. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm honored to be here with you, Erico, and uh, Alex, and some uh, pillars of the Plum community. Uh, but so my story is, uh, well, I've been a developer since the 80s and uh, I uh, discovered Python in 98 and, uh, and, and got really involved in the community. It was something new for me. We're going to talk about that, uh, hopefully, you know, this idea of a community that's not tied by working for a company or uh, just the special interest in contributing to open source. And I founded a company that was that used uh, Zope, the framework and the line Plone. And then uh, eventually we migrated to Plone as well. And then I went to work with, Simp to, with, with Erico at Simplis Consultoria. And since then, I, I've been always involved in Python. And I, I, I wrote a book called Fluent Python that was published in nine different languages so far. And I just finished the second edition uh, last year. So thank you. OK, uh, let's go back to the beginning, a long, long time ago in a far, far away galaxy. I, and I really hope Disney is not watching this, because probably there are lawyers already suing us. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm Erico. I'm the president of the Plon Foundation. We're going to talk about the Plon Foundation later. But uh, I'm also part of the Plon Gov VR uh, community. Yeah, just to, to make sure. So, Limi, how did Plon happen? And uh, I, you see, a few weeks ago, I was in a conference, and there was this, uh, there was an old 8-bit computer called MSX. And one of the great, uh, biggest life's uh, mystery is what MSX stands for. There are 20 different explanations. And then someone decided to ask the creator what it was, and now we have 21 different explanations. So even though I heard the story many, many times, I'm pretty sure you're going to, to tell it in a different way. So how did Plon happen? Um, let's see, where do we start? Uh, so one of my friends worked at a game company, uh, I think Norway's only game company at the time, uh, Funcom. They still exist, I think. They made like one of the first multiplayer online games, uh, which I forget what it's called right now, but this was back when, you know, you were on dial of modems and stuff like that. And and they had like a 3D world that was very primitive that you ran around in. Anyway, um, at his work, he um, he used something called Zope, or he just found it. It was like when Zope was pretty new. Um, and I was talking to him. He's like an old childhood friend. We've known each other since I was like 11 years old or something. Um, which, speaking of MSX, that came out of uh, the Amiga scene, if you know the Commodore Amiga old computer. Anyway, um, so we were, at the time we we wanted, this was like around 2000, I guess, a little, little before that. Um, and it was this big explosion uh, on the internet where MP3 had come along, right? And uh, there was a lot of pirating of music. Um, there was an attempt to kind of, 
on a global scale, kind of build what Bandcamp and those kind of things have built today, where you have this, uh, you know, if you're an artist, you can self-publish your music and get paid for it. Uh, so we wanted to do that in Norway uh, because we also had a domain mp3.no. So we were like, yeah, that sounds good. Let's build a website and let's let's allow people to upload, you know, mp3s and self-publish your music, right? Uh, which, you know, side story that got us into a lot of trouble with, uh, you know, the Norwegian music industry was freaking out because they were like, they're going to put us out of business. Um, so we had to go talk to all the like rights holders and stuff like that to make sure, no, no, we're not going to put up like illegal, illegally pirated music. This is for artists that don't have record contracts. So anyway, um, so that, that led us to Zoop, um, because I, I didn't know I'm not a programmer, right. But I could do things in Zoop like you guys do, where you select something and you copy and you have a new tree of content and upload a file and all that stuff. So Zoop was very revolutionary at the time because there was nothing that had even remotely a user interface uh, before that. And uh, Z classes was like a big deal to a person like me where I could go in and just define specific you know, UI elements and structures and stuff like that. So, so I was like, oh yeah, this is great. Uh, you know, Little did I know that you know all of this stuff is is very <laughs> once you start scaling and stuff like that things get complicated. So, um, so went from that. So so Plone came out of starting to like we were building a system in in Zoop to do this music website and we had it working and mostly it, but it kind of fell off the radar because we didn't have time to it wasn't a profitable thing to do right it was more something we wanted to do so um, so from there. Uh, I think I ended up, I was working for a home automation company at the time in a German one, and then they went out of business. So I was uh, without a job for a while. Uh, the good thing about Norway is they really take care of people, like the social security net there is very good. So, you know, if you're out of a job, I was uh, straight out of school, so I didn't have any income. Um, they give you money to pay rent and get food and all that stuff. So I was essentially sitting at home, um, playing around with Zope, and then, um, I think I joined uh, the Zope channel on, was it Fnet? Something like that. IRC, for those of you. Uh, is IRC still a thing in, in the Plone community? Has that moved to? Not Plone? anymore. Okay. Yep. Because of the whole free node uh, situation, okay. we I, moved on. I see. I see. I didn't follow it. Uh, the old Finnish invention that is IRC. IRC actually existed before the web, which is kind of mind blowing. Like it's, it's a really old technology. Um, so on there, I was asking questions about. Uh, Python and Zope and stuff like that. And then I ran into a guy called Alan, uh, and he was really helping me out with all, all my stupid questions. Um, so then, uh, you know, we started talking. Uh, I was often up late at night because that's how I work. That's when I when I do my best work, or at least my work. Um, so our time zones kind of overlap perfectly because he was in Houston and I was, you know, up in the middle of the night in Norway. So uh, I was usually awake when he was awake. Um, so from there, he, I think he one day said, look, uh, he was like showing me a, a site he was building for a customer, just like the prototype of it. And I was like, this UI is terrible. You need to move this over here. You need to, you know, this makes no sense. Like these buttons shouldn't be down here. This can't affect this thing. Nobody's going to get this. So and he's like, oh, okay. So you actually know how this works. Uh, so he offered me to work on that uh, contract as the designer, essentially. Um, so that's where Plone started. It started as an intranet for a probably evil uh, Houston oil company. Um, so, but you know, we extracted some value from from the oil company and gave it back to open source. So that's good. Um, so from there, we just started building, you know, reusable components and frameworks and stuff like that because we realized everybody needs kind of an intranet like solution. So if we can build a generalized product that we can deploy to multiple customers, we can, you know, get get good good contracts and good good jobs uh, from that. So that's where it came from. And then we needed to pick a name for it. Uh, and that's probably the, the thing you're <laughs> referencing. I think it's in the FAQ. So it's not nothing like super exciting. Uh, well, we were both into the same kind of music. So that that's the other thing with Alan. We we got along on, on many levels. Just, you know, we, we were talking, half the time we we're just talking about music instead of talking about Zope and Plone and stuff like that. Um, and so there's an artist on uh, Warp Records, which also has uh, a fixed twin, and it's like an electronic label in the UK. Um, so they had a, a, a group called Plone, 
which we both really liked. It's like a very minimalist, uh, like playful music. It's very like fun to have in the background to kind of stimulate your brain while you're working. So we were both listening to that at the time. Uh, and then the band broke up soon after, I think. Uh, but, you know, we just stole the name because we thought it was a fun, fun word. And this was back in the day when, uh, you know, everybody, every, this was like still when the word Google was weird. Like, well, what does that even mean? Right. So we were like, oh, we can have a weird word too. Uh, so then we can get plone.org and plone.com and all this stuff. Um, so that's how we named it. Uh, and then I think the next big thing that happened was we both decided to go to Europython and... Uh, What's that? Charlois, I think the first one. Yes. Or, yeah. Uh, and that's actually the first time I met and talked to Alan. Like we had just been talking over RC. We hadn't even had a phone call or any kind of like, you know, back in the day, voice, voice over internet wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of bandwidth. So that was also complicated. Um, so it's kind of funny. Like we worked together probably for two years without even speaking. So, um, and then we met at EuroPython. Uh, we were sitting in the audience for a Zope talk, and then suddenly Paul Everett is like, oh, there's this cool new thing called Plone. Are, are those people here? Because he was just calling out, you know, the cool things that he'd seen in community, um, Python and uh, Zope communities. So we were like, what, us? Because uh, we didn't even know that anybody was aware of Plone at the time. And he was like, oh, this is incredible. Like, you guys have, you know, taken Zope to the next level by building something useful on top of it. So, so that's where that came from. Good. Um... Luciano, how did you get to know Plon? Because uh, first came you know you you've been working with Zoop since forever, and then Plon came along. So how did that happen? Uh, so uh, yeah, I just I started working with Python in '98, and the reason was because I wanted to do. Uh, web development, back-end web development. And uh, the two, I had studied Perl for a while, and then I studied uh, Java. And I wanted something that, well, and then one day I, I discovered Python because in the Perl mailing lists, they often talked about how things were done in Python because Python was object-oriented and Perl initially was not, and then it became object-oriented. So they were always looking at how things were done in Python. And when I discovered Python, it was great because I thought, well, this is like the best of what I, is, is the best features of, is the features that I like most about Perl combined with the features that I like most about Java without the major defects that Perl and Java have. So, and the first thing, the first commercial project that I did with it was using an embryo of Zoop called Bobo. And I remember thinking at the time, because this is full in Portuguese, it's going to be hard to sell projects based on something called Bobo. But <laughs> we figured out, I sold the first one uh, and it was okay. Anyway, so I, I created a company and we started developing intranets in, 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 in Zoop because, uh, yeah. Uh, and then we, we developed our own product on top of it, and then Plone came along, and we just had to migrate because it was the, the power of, you know, I don't know, dozens or hundreds of smart people against us, a, a small company in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So there was no way to Sorry compete. Sorry for putting out your framework out of business. Yeah, no problem, because we migrated to Plone, and we didn't have to pay anything for that. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> It reduced our development costs. But uh, yes, uh, but the interest, but so, so I, I was kind of a, so I was early in Python and a little bit uh, late in Plone because of that situation. But I would like to, I was uh, interested uh, watching Govea's talk. His timeline starts in 2009, but I think I, I know an event that happened in 2002 that is extremely relevant to what we are doing here. So first of all, we need to understand that there was a, there was the, uh, a Python community in Brazil and there was a Zoop community. And uh, Rafa and Jean 
were, you know, started this op at least gave a, gave a name to the Zop community by creating a site called Chezop. So it was the first site in Brazil that was uniting this community, just like there was Python, uh, python.com.br, I don't remember, no, I don't remember. Anyway, the other Python that was created by Osvaldo. Anyway, around those sites, the community started getting together and, uh, and we started and we met online, but then we met physically during FISLI, which was a great event that was, that happened every year in, in Porto Alegre. And so that's where we became friends. We met personally and, uh, uh, but the, the interesting thing is we knew at the time that, so that was around 2002 or three, okay? But I think it was 2002 because I think it was the last uh, months of the uh, FHC government. And Serpro was about to buy, to spend, I don't know, several million dollars in a, in a, in a product called uh, Vignette. The Vignette is a CMS, a CMS, a huge proprietary CMS, yes, what was. And the biggest case in Brazil was global.com, uh, the G1 uh, was built using that. And then, but there was people in Serpro who believed in, in free software, who believed in open source software. And they uh, started, you know, looking around for something different. And uh, at this Feasley, our community, that we called ourselves the PZP community, Python Zope and Plone community, or Plone Zope and Python, whatever. Uh, so we we had a, a few slots in Fizzly, and in uh, one of the slots was a talk about with Shiru talking about archetypes, and it was full of UML diagrams and a lot of code, and I, I think it was even XML. I don't remember. It was yeah, just, we were. I mean, we were. There was a tool to convert UML to yes. archetypes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Is it, exactly. Actually, I have a question just quickly. Go, go ahead. Did you guys know that PCP is a drug? Was that intentional? No, no. No, okay. 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 It's yeah. a very bad, it's a very synthetic drug and yes. that is very yeah. bad. But <laughs> I'm just wondering because, you know, sometimes people say yeah. Python okay. is a drug and stuff like that. So, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Uh, so, so, the, the, uh, and then there was somebody from Serpro there, I forgot his name now, and he was watching, but he was like, you know, this is too complicated. There's no way this is gonna fly, you know, in the government. And we realized that that was happening, you know, and that was a good, very good chance. And the problem was not with Shiru's talk or Shiru himself, he's an excellent technical guy, but the problem was he was preaching to the choir, you know? <laughs> He was talking to the hardcore Python, Zope, and Plone community there. And so for anybody that was just coming in, and that was the only talk about the topic, was too much, you know, very too technical, too complicated. And so then we, we managed to corner this uh, Serpro guy, sit him on a table, and then talk to him. No, here's what how these things work, okay? This is really cool and so on. And then they gave me uh, the list of, of features that they were putting on an RFP to uh, justify the purchase of Vignette, basically. They were competing. Vignette was competing with Oracle, Porto, and some other th stuff like that. And we managed, and this is the power of the community, right? We managed to tick every box because the product itself Plone and Zoop is they they have features that are unique to this day. Uh, Python as well, and then there were plugins for doing lots of things. So we managed to tick all the boxes. Everything that uh, uh, Vignette does, we can do in, in Zoop and Plone. Plus, we can use Python, which is much better than Java. And anyway, so I think this was decisive because. Uh, the, the, uh, a few months after that, Serpro launched their first uh, portal written in Zoop and, and Plone. And Leonardo, a friend of the community, helped them. You know, he was kind of embedded with them in Rio, in Serpro in Rio, 
for several weeks and they developed in record time this new portal that was launched. I think that was still the FHC government. So, yeah. Uh, and why, 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 what did we have to gain to do that? And this is something that I want to talk to you about. One reason to specialize in open source software, in a particular software, is that then you become an expert at something that has a demand without needing to play the, the game or dance to the music of a big corporation, you know? Because if you have a Microsoft certification, you know, for instance, last year, Microsoft announced a huge investment in metaverse, right? A couple of, months, a couple of weeks ago, they shut down the metaverse division and fired everybody, <laughs> right? So, uh, but with an open source community, and this is crazy because it's, it's counterintuitive. We, we tend to believe, oh no, Microsoft is a solid corporation, right? No, oh, but you know, an executive there makes a decision, boom. You know, thousands of jobs lost. A whole technology, a whole ecosystem of consultants gone from day to night, okay? But on the other hand, funny, right? Let's share the joke later. But uh, on the other hand, the, in, a, in an open source community, you can actually, like Eric was saying, you can actually follow what's going on and what will go on. What's going, what, what's on their plans? Because everything is discussed in the open, you know, plans for the next two, three years, you know, what's gonna be done in the next sprints, whatever, you know? So this is open and it's safe. It's safer than betting on any corporation because, you know, uh, any corporation can just shut down a project just like that, just because they decided and they will never tell you before, right? They will just announce, oh, you know that thing? No more, from today, no more, right? So uh, that's one, something that I want to tell you about. So it's, it's good for your career because it's a safe path instead of you know, being uh, specialized in some proprietary thing. Uh, there are two, two things that happen on the chat. The first one I'm not going to put there because uh, it's going to expose a friend of ours but someone basically said the name of the drug is pcp not pcp and of course we know the person and thank you we are not going to put your question uh, here for the posterity and actually there's a question from julio zinga and he's asking about what was the problem clone was solving back then and is this still relevant today? I mean, it was essentially internet, right? So, and those still exist. Uh, they have changed shape, but you know, if you go look at, uh, I think the best analogy today, it's uh, Atlassian, this huge company that has built everything in one suite. And, and we did the same thing where, you know, we had issue trackers inside of Plone. I'm, I'm not saying this is a good idea, but, uh, you know, we built this software suite of just the tools you need to get to, to, to do your job, right? Like it, you could put documents online, you could have issue trackers, project management, all that stuff uh, we built software for. So, and that that's a very stable and, you know, evergreen category that that need will never go away the tools will evolve but uh you know a tool like clone can uh can can evolve with that so uh, I, I mean i'm i'm amazed that clone is still around 20 years later because uh, you know i haven't been part of clone for at least 10 years so, um so but it, to to go back to his point like it's it's a very robust thing like open source communities you know that you can't kill them essentially uh, yeah. they will always be around they uh, you know they they may go up and down in popularity or need to change with the times and that's i think one, one of the things that plone did really well was we were never afraid to uh, you know kill our code right we were like oh this this is old and, and that can be frustrating where you're you're in the middle of it but you have to evolve or you know you die so um so plone has done a lot of uh, even on the community side, it, it did smart things on uh, moving with the times, even though we may not have uh, fully subscribed to what that thing was. So one thing that I remember is um, 
you know, just, just simple things like picking the right uh, infrastructure around the project where we started out uh, using CVS for version control for those of you who are old enough to know what CVS is. Uh, and then we had to switch to something called Subversion, which was a moderately better version or quite a bit better version, but it was still CVS. And then um, a bunch of other, uh, and I promise I'll get to, to a funny story at the end of this, but uh, there is, uh, we had to, the kind of distributed version control systems came along and it wasn't clear which one would win. Uh, and there were a bunch of them, and a lot of them were a lot better than Git, which would, the world is using now, which has the most terrible user interface I've ever seen in any command line product. Uh, but it won because the implementation model was very good. Uh, and you know, I, I've actually talked to Linus about that, but it's it's just like the worst interface for any human to use. So, and it still isn't solved. Like I use Git every day, and I have tools on top of it, and I still, when I fuck up, it's like. Google, right? Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So that's an example of a technology that we adopted, even though we, we had to hold our nose and say, you know what, like, we really don't like Git. We have four other version control systems that are vastly superior for end users and kind of developers. But we see where the world's going. If we are not on Git, then nobody's going to use our system because we have this weird version control system, right? So that's a, that's a very important lesson as an open source project is it's easy to get caught up in like, which one is the optimal implementation of something uh, versus what what are people actually using? Right? So, um, so that that's one thing I think Plon was always very good at and say you know what like we're gonna go over here because that's where the people are and and that's how Plon happened from the other side like he came from his own framework in Zope and then Plon came along and he was like well I'm gonna you know, as they say in, in the US, hitch my wagon onto this car, right? Like uh, there's something going on here, it's going faster than we can move. So I'm gonna jump aboard that train. A lot of bad analogies here, but uh, so, uh, okay, funny little story. Uh, Plone is very much about the community, right? Like we, we usually say it's, it's the code is unimportant. It's gonna be gone in 40 years anyway. And or we used to say 20 years, but here I am 20 years later. So that didn't work out. Uh, but you know, uh, I've, I've met so many of my friends in this community that are their friends to this day. Uh, and that that's the thing to to remember when you're working on, in open source, there are so many great people and you you make friends and you know you, you talk to people that, that are incredibly intelligent, that are working on this open system uh, and they could be doing anything else, but they're here and, and working with you. So um, jumping a little bit around. Uh, so when when this version controls, distributed version control system came out, Git and all those competitors, one of the things I remember is talking about community, the sprint. Sprints are a very core part of Plone's community because that's when we all get together. And, and usually that's when people meet for the first time. And that's also how we recruited so many, like. I don't know any other open source system at the time that had like 400 core contributors, right? It's insane. Like oh, we always just said, you know, we have version control. We just let in everybody as long as they've signed the contributor agreement, because that was a way to secure the the rights for Plone so that we know that the Plone Foundation owns the code. Like when we introduced the Plone Foundation, uh, we we had to get everybody that had contributed to Plone retroactively sign an agreement to make sure we own the code. And you know that's that's pretty crazy when you think about it. You need to like find everybody in the world and get them to sign a piece of paper. Uh, and you know it's been years for here. So, uh, but we made it into uh, uh, like a, cl a classic thing that we invited everybody to come to sprints. A lot of people there had never contributed to Plone, and our goal was sign a contributor agreement, and we make you do one commit to the repository, so we know that you can, you know, you're set up to contribute code. And it doesn't matter. It could be a, a typo fix and a piece of documentation or whatever. But we want you to feel like you own a piece of this project now. You have signed a thing that says, you know, I'm, I'm contributing to this and you have the rights. You can go in and delete the entire repository if you want. Like, go for it. We'll, we'll probably kick you out, but, you know, you, you can do it. So, um, by the way, Fanny, sorry. Yep. Something like that happened. Uh, uh, two months ago, someone deleted okay, cool. one yeah, package. So yeah. it works. The, the plan works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so one of the stories I remember from the sprints, we have a lot of sprints that we can talk about. That they're kind of legendary in, in Plone community because we've had so many ridiculous stories. But uh, one of the sprints we did, it, actually in Norway, uh, was called the Archipelago Sprint. Uh, we took everybody onto an island 
with no internet. Uh, and we put people in a room and we were working on Plon. And the first problem we have then is like, how do you even, how do you even, you know, commit code to the repository when you don't have internet, right? <laughs> so what we did, <coughs> we set up a local server. Uh, I think it actually interfaced. It was like early, uh, one of these distributed control systems that could interface with Subversion. So everybody committed code to a desktop computer we had uh, on site because we had a local network inside that building. And every every night after we were done coding and about to start drinking beer, uh, three people went up to the highest point on the island, carrying the computer and a mobile phone that had a uh, 2.5G network or 2G network. And because that was the only place you could get uh, coverage with the cell network. And they would carry this computer up there. It's like an observation post. It's like an old uh, like war kind of from World War II. Went up there, brought uh, some sort of battery so they could power the computer. And then... Um, they would connect over this incredibly slow connection and put the all the day's commits upstream essentially so that every day we were like climbing to the top of this island to get the code into the repository so you know we wouldn't lose it because you know who knows what would have happened to that pc if somebody spilled beer in it or something so uh that that's just like one of the crazy things that that we did code wise. It's like nobody would do that. Nobody should do that. But we just wanted to code. We were in this location. We found a way to get that code upstream, even from the island, which was pretty funny. And it's a long tradition. Like Plone, Plone 1.0 was announced from a, a Swiss, Swiss cable car. Like I was literally, I, was, I had one of the first smartphones in the world, like an uh, Ericsson. Uh, and I sent out the announcement of Plone 1.0 from a cable car in Switzerland. Like, and that doesn't make any sense, but we were in Switzerland. We wanted to have fun, but we also needed to work. So uh, <laughs> so we have a lot of uh, stunt development in, in the Plone community where we go places that make no sense, but they're fun, right? And that's, that's how you make people show up to these sprints. You're like, come to Switzerland. We have a, a cabin in the Alps, and we're going to go like snowshoeing, and then they're going to feed us disgusting fondue, right? Like, it's, it's <laughs> like we do all these things. And one of the things that is very fun about Plone is I think we've exposed a lot of people to cultures they've never seen, right? Like all these Americans coming over and suddenly they're in Vienna, right? Or in some sort of small village in the Swiss Alps or, you know, they've never done this. And and now they're like the kind of people that start traveling and and, and, and visit places and, and they have their friends, you know, in, in Germany, they have a lot of friends. So it's one of those things that, that again, that's what comes out of it. The friendship, the connections, the networks you get. So that that's the point of open source. Don't forget that. Like the, it's the humans, not not the software. Although the software turns out to be around forever. So uh, that's that's a good one. So first thing is, there's a question coming all the way from India from Mr. Alok Kumar. Hey, Alok. And actually, I believe you you mentioned that. But uh, did you ever think in the early days that you would be talking about Plone, not the band, even though they're back. They they're back. That, yes. Plone the band is actually back. I saw that and I was like, Alan, Plone is back. They have a new album. And we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so did you ever think that 25 years or 20 years later, you'd still be talking about the Plone CMS? Probably not, <laughs> especially since I haven't been part of the community for a decade or more. Uh, yeah, no, I'm very happy that I think uh, you know, I, I don't know if this is his original thought, like Paul Everett, I don't know if you guys know who, who he is, uh, but he was always very good at distilling down uh, what things were. So he was the first one to say, you know, Plone is the community, like it's, the software is an artifact of the community. The software is just like some output, right? Like the community is. Uh, but, sorry, so essentially, I think he, he also said, you know, the the, any any open source project becomes an extension of its founders, right? So if you have founders that are a certain way, they attract people like them, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, me and Alan are pretty different, but we're both very open to new people and you know, being nice to people and helping people. And you know, we met him helping me. That that's how it all started. That's mm -hmm. that that first interaction is the core of everything in Plone, which is he was like, hey, I can help you. Like I see what you're trying to do. Let me send you a snippet of code that does that thing that you're trying to do, and that's that's take that and multiply it by a, a billion, and that's blown, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think we, 
you know, we didn't do anything special outside of doing what we do naturally, but I think that has set up Plone to be very robust in the sense that everybody in the Plone community really love each other. Like it's, and you can see on these sprints, like people that have been around the community for like 10, 20 years, and you can just see them light up when they meet each other. And, and it's just wonderful to see that. Uh, and that's what builds in that resilience, right? Because everybody wants to help somebody like, uh, you know, I could probably go incognito into wherever the Plone channel is right now and say I have a problem and I'll have three people that want to help me immediately, right? It's just a culture we have built. And and that builds in this resilience in the open source project that is very fascinating. Yeah. Um, first of all, that's uh, that's true. Uh, going to play, actually, we, we joke in the community that the... Uh, Actually, the Plone community is a drinking community with a software problem. That is also our fault. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> because no. it's it's like the community exists, and then we have a software that's the excuse for the community to exist. Because we go and even if you're out of the community, I was out for a few years, and then I came back to a conference in Barcelona, and it kicking like okay, I need to to be here. This is the place. And uh, this is this is really important. It's I I dare to say that one of the reasons the software is good and software evolves is because the culture is around the community and not around the foundation or the right. the software itself. And it's a it's a huge degree of trust, right? You just trust everybody to be a good person, and and that's being rewarded, right? Like it's. It's never wrong to trust people, especially when you have version control. But uh, you know, you, you you trust people, and they will step up to to that level. You give them a responsibility; they will, you know, take that seriously, and they will go and deliver on that. Like the amount of incredible code and infrastructure, and and just like systems that have been written by people that came out of nowhere, right? That uh, going back to Brazil and the community here, right? So we we never knew about the Serpro thing. We just realized suddenly there's a lot of Brazilian people in the Plone community. We have no idea what, why that is happening. Uh, but uh, the translation framework in Plone, Plone was probably one of the first open source projects that came out of the box with like 30 translations, right? And that came from Brazil. That was somebody from Brazil. Uh, and you can look up the names and stuff like that. I don't want to uh, leave anybody out, but uh, you know, that just stepped up and said, hey, we need, Brazil. instead of writing our entire software in Brazilian, right? We are gonna give a an abstraction that lets you have it in two languages because we probably, if you make Brazilian government websites, you probably need to have English versions of some of it. We, <clears throat> so, and that entire thing just came out of somebody in Brazil needing to have two languages. And then suddenly that became the standard. And then we recruited a bunch of people and suddenly we have 30 translations, right? Um, so, it's a good illustration of like somebody just decided to do it. It happened. It became the standard, and and we kept evolving it. And I'm not sure how we do translations now, but I'm I'm pretty convinced it's, it's relatively like if I looked at that code now, I would understand what is happening because it's similar to how it always worked. So, okay, uh, Luciano, can you do a parallel uh, between the Plone community and the Python community? Even though Python now it's so popular and huge. That I'm pretty sure if I go to PyCon US, I'm going to feel like what? But you've been there for quite a long time. You've been to conferences, like the earliest Plone conference, and also EuroPython and PyCon. Can you say uh, uh, if there are parallels and how the the culture helps the the software? Uh. I think uh, I think one key parallel is the fact that both are examples of successful open source projects that grew without corp corporate sponsorship and without depending on government sponsorship. And uh, I've been thinking as we talk about communities here, uh, uh, I was telling Rafaela last night that, uh, you know, we had these people uh, camping in front of, of uh, army bases around Brazil. And uh, one insight that I had watching that was that maybe ideology drove them there. 
But what made them stay day after day after day, maybe was that some of them found something there that they had not, never found before and that we found in the free software community, which is this, this feeling of being part of a community that is aligned and that, you know, I am, I, we are here solving the problem of water in our, in our, you know, camping because there's no water and how do we, you know, so the, people are in, in solidarity, you know, and I think that is something that motivated them to stay. And so of course, we need to give them better reasons to do that, right? Uh, so um, maybe churches do that sometimes, but most of the time, I don't think the churches do a very good job of creating communities. Uh, so, and, and, and I think open source and Wikipedia projects like that, actually, you know, they, 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 uh, they thrive because human beings, even though that's not what we are taught in this con consumerism, uh, consumerist uh, society, we are built for solidarity. And that's how we, you know, uh, took over the, the caves because the caves allowed us protection from predators. And then we, we managed to learn how to do fire and then grow as, as and a then species. Came along. So until, yes, exactly. So uh, the, path, the path from fire to plone, right? Anyway, so what, what I'm saying is uh, we are actually built for, for solidarity, for helping each other. And when you're given that opportunity, the rewards, you know, like uh, emotional rewards, I would even, I was about to say spiritual rewards, but I actually, uh, anyway, this, the rewards are amazing. And it's something that you have to experiment. And the only way to experiment is to commit to something like the Plone community, the Python community, an open source community is an example, or go contribute to Wikipedia and so on and so forth. So uh, yeah, I think uh, the idea of having successful projects that are hugely important for humanity, like Wikipedia, uh, and Wikipedia way, finally replaced my CSS code because they were using my CSS code for. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that. <laughs> so, you know, that's why Wikipedia and Plone look much alike because <laughs> they they stole my CSS with permission. But, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, anyway, the these projects are amazing because they leverage this thing that is like a third way. It's not government funded and it's not corporate funded. It's people working together because they enjoy working together. And if I can add on to that. So the thing that is hard to kind of remember uh, is how crazy open source was in like 1999. Like it, it was this crazy experimental model that nobody thought could work, right? It's, it was before anybody, like the only big open source projects were things like Linux and a very early, shitty version of Linux, uh, you know, uh, existed and people were like, that's never gonna work. Uh, and, you know, to the point where <laughs> the, the reason I met Martin Aspelli, which wrote um, Dexterity and a lot of like old uh, stuff, he was writing his master's thesis on how can open source even work and how do open source communities work? And that's how I met him. And everybody thinks it's because we're both Norwegian, but he actually, lived in London and has lived in London for most of his life. So it's just a coincidence. Like we didn't know each other at all. Uh, but this this thing where open source, we started this project before open source was a proven model. And that, that was the biggest thing when you're talking about vignette and going up against these big corporate uh, things was, but how do you how do you know this project is going to be around? And vignette is dead and Plon is still here. So I don't know. It, it proved itself, <laughs> but it took some time to, to show that. And, and these days it's super normal. Like every company has an open source division and they put their code out there. And if it's anything, they, they know, like Facebook knows that by open sourcing React, React will, you know, exist and become better and become, it's, it's easier for them to recruit engineers because they're already used to tools that, they need to use inside of Facebook. So, so it's not it's not out of the goodness of their hearts. It's the yeah. the smart business movement is to open source stuff because then then you expand your recruiting pool massively and 
you you get to set the standard for what goes on in the world. Apple, right? Open. It's kind of crazy how much they actually open source. They didn't never talk about it, but like the amount of code Apple open source is insane. Like we we have Chrome because of Apple, right? We have WebKit and and you know uh, what was the um, KD K K something K Conqueror is that what it's called? The old web browser. That's yeah. where the predecessor to WebKit. So, so they took some open source code, they improved it to the point where it was actually production ready and a real browser, and then they put it back into um, the open source world. They open sourced all the underpinnings of Mac OS, all that stuff. So even a company that is seen as secretive and very like, hmm, nobody knows what's going on here, Swift, like everything, they, they, they publish a bunch of code because it's the smart thing to do. So one, one, one thing I want to add in here is like, uh, the lesson uh, a long, a long time ago, uh, when I was new to the broad Plon community, I was part of the Plon community since 2004 in Brazil. But I do remember that uh, Eric Steele, he gave a talk and at some point he mentioned that uh, another open source project, Debian, mentioned that the average time of a contributor in the project was seven years. Because life happens, you, you start, you learn, at some point you grow, you become a leader there, and at some point you get an offer or you decide to to write uh, crime novels or yeah, that's a really funny story. That's, yeah. We can get that, to the castle sprints and, and those yeah. kind of things, but and then you move on, and then there's a new generation and so on and so forth. That happens in the prone community even more often. Uh, we have the other part that people go go out and at some point when they are happy, had had shitload of money because Salesforce paid them. Hey, David. And uh, other people in the community that basically left, make mo made money and came back to the community because of the community. It's like, okay, I could be doing AI, but the community, the prone community is, is cool. And uh, you mentioned Castle Sprint. I, I want to ask you both some of your best safe for work because the Plum community has crazy amount of not safe for work stories, even these days, and not, even though we are old. Safe. They're just, uh, you know, they're, they're all very wholesome, but they're all kind of crazy. So, yeah. <laughs> so but nobody right. got hurt and nobody, you know, hopefully as far as I know, uh, but yeah, sorry. So your favorite stories from the plant community, <laughs> from sprints, from conferences? Right. Uh, I think it's always just like people show up and then random things happen. But uh, a couple of guys showed up. They actually uh, flew me to Austria because they wanted help with uh, a project they were working on. So they hired me to work on this thing. And I get to the airport and they pick me up in this like super old school uh, American, you know, these huge, like massive 60s cars, like Blues Brothers style, right? And we're driving down um, the highway and then they pull up and it's like a castle. And I'm like, okay, uh, am I going to a castle? And then he's like, oh yeah, no, uh, he's a prince, you know, like, and, and, <laughs> and in Europe, you know, prince just means they, they used to own this piece of land, right? It's like, a, I don't know what the term is. Uh, but, you know, the old structure where there were like hundreds of princes that yeah. had these. Uh, so Austria had a bunch of those and, and they still have the prince titles and they still have castles. So he lives in the castle. Uh, and so I spend like a month working from a castle, which is cool. I um, actually talked to his uh, his wife and I was like, when he met you, did he just like walk up to you and say, hey, want to come home to my castle? And she was like, yeah, pretty much. That's So, <laughs> so pro tip, if you want to, you know, Get a wife, get a castle first, and then you can you know, go do that. No, uh, but then um, you know they became part of the community. Uh, the the guy that is not a prince, he is now one of like a very famous crime author, crime novel author in Germany, which is funny because I would never have guessed that. Uh, I was told that a couple of years ago. Uh, but we were thinking, uh, you know, we should have a sprint here. We should get people to come here because, of course, the castle is massive. It's like you can fit probably the entire Blown Conference inside of it. Um, so we did. Uh, and then uh, we had a Blown Conference in Vienna. Um, that also came out of that. Uh, we had uh, one of the most surreal experiences is we're in this, like, big castle. 
there's like paintings on the wall and he's like yeah the, those those paintings are my ancestors right it's like super old school like paintings from the 1600s and it's like yeah that's my great 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 granddad uh, and then uh we have one of the top you know probably top 10 concert pianists in the world come in and play rachmaninov for us in the castle and i'm just like what is happening <laughs> so <laughs> it was just one of those like magical moments that will always stay with you where the community came together i think we were like 30 or 40 people at that sprint and you know wrote a bunch of code decided a bunch of future stuff because that's a lot of what happens at sprint is you have to get together in a room and have that trust and say okay th these are the trade-offs and this is the kind of thing we want to build and everybody has strong opinions on how to build things uh but you can't hash that out on a mailing list or even in uh you know irc or a chat room uh, you have to meet face to face so you can see the nuance of like, no, 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 I, I'm very attached to this idea, but not as attached to this idea. And then you come to a compromise and then you build some code together, right? And that also builds trust because you're like, oh, this guy that I disagreed on, on this like architectural thing, he has a lot of really good ideas and his code is fantastic. And like, he really is making that thing that I wanted to build happen. So, um, so did that, uh, but it's just this like incredible, after that, everybody talks about the castle sprint, right? And nobody can put their finger on what was so magical about it. But it, it, again, it is the community, right? You come back and you're like, I met four four new friends and, and I was in a castle and Rachmaninoff was being played on a piano by a concert pianist. And I don't know why that was, but it happened, right? Uh, yeah, well, I think we're talking, I've, I've been thinking, we, we're talking a lot about sprints, and sprints is a word that is used in uh, conventional software development these days, and it's important to understand that, you know, it's the same word, but with a different meaning, so. In oh, yeah, sorry, we should clarify, like, so, and, yes. and we, this is also a common thing to do in open source communities these days. Like you do get together and have, a, they call them hackathons, I guess, like, but but we were extremely, as an open source community, we were among the first to do that. So yes. Like, and that, that, that is actually also how I met uh, Guido van Rossum, the, uh, mm -hmm. the founder of Python. And we worked together because he was working uh, on Zope at the time. And for some reason he really liked me because he, I was probably the first designer that he could talk to because I understand code and design so when he we were working on some like front end ui code and he really liked me and then a couple of years later he is my referral to google he's like google you you need to hire alex he's the best designer i ever worked with i don't know if that's what he said <laughs> but like they called me and i'm like okay so yeah guido said we need to talk to you because <laughs> you should work here and so you know through throughout this stuff it's kind of crazy how how it changes your career i moved to san francisco i work in the tech industry and that all happens because i showed up at a sprint and got sat next to the founder of python right it's just very random you never know where those kind of connections come from so yeah yeah and so the sprints for us they are something that complement the fact that we are always doing distributed development and sometimes like like uh Alex explained so well, some decisions are much easier to take. They, they could take weeks or months to be take, to be made on a mailing list. But if everybody that cares about the issue or most people that care about the issue are in the same room, then people can reach agreements uh, faster. Uh, um, so one story that I, that I have about the the community is that in 2012 was the first time that I spoke it up at a no well, actually I presented a poster at a Python community in the uh, PyCon in the US 2013 was the first time that I actually spoke but 2012 was okay so that was in Santa Clara and the next year was also in Santa Clara and Santa Clara is a city in the middle of the Silicon Valley. Uh, it's sort of like Brasilia in the sense that there's no way you can get anything to eat if you don't have a car. You are in a hotel in the middle of nothing. It's not like the hotel sector here that has restaurants. It's just like a hotel here and a hotel there and so on. It was very, and the prone people, the prone community, they saw that in the first year, the second, they knew the the PyCon was going to be in the same place the next year. 
and said, no, this is wrong. You know, we, we need to have a way to go for drinks after the, the, the conference, which is not just the hotel bar, you know? And so the next year they rented an RV that had like, I think eight beds. So it was a big RV and it was called the Plone Bus. So some people were staying at the, at, at the RV, sleeping at the RV, was parked in front of the venue for the conference. And also they, you could go there for drinks after the, the, there was a little happy hour in, in, in the parking lot in front of the RV and you paid for the drinks so that it helped pay for the cost of the RV. And then they left about 7 p.m. They left for San Francisco, which was an hour drive so that we could have, you know, drinks in some bar. And so I thought, this is great. You know, this is a community. They enjoy themselves and they like to be able to go out together. And so the first year wasn't so good because, you know, it was a place in the middle of nothing. But the second year, they solved the problem by hiring this, by renting this RV. Yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of, it's kind of, there's this slogan, there's, there was a t-shirt uh, about the Python community that, that applies even better to the Plone community, which is, uh, I came from, I came from the tech, I came for the technology and I stayed for the people, you know? The technology attracts people and then when you meet the other people, you stay. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's super important. And I think you guys have an opportunity to make much more out of this community if you, if you contribute more. <laughs> Basically, that's it. You know, there's a, uh, there's a, a balance there. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, we are running out of time, but then, uh, the plone community had a bus and the plone community had a boat. The plone boat. The plone boat. 2012 in a conference, uh, we decided to host a conference in a city with not that many hotel rooms. So they decided basically to rent a boat and some people stayed on the boat, right? He was there. <laughs> and uh, actually it was insane, right? Because, uh, yes, in Aaron. And it was insane, amazing. We have stories of people getting arrested because they won a, a sword in a bingo. And, and tried that, to bring it back to Finland. Yes, exactly. And customs. it's illegal for you to walk with a sword in uh, the Netherlands. So, yeah, things like that happen in the plural community. Uh, I'm and going to open for uh, for questions. We have. I would one. like to mention one thing yeah. since, it's, since, since I'm in Brazil and I need to make this short because I'm going to start crying if I talk about it too long. But uh, just as an example of how tight knit the, the community is and how how much of a family it is. And I know this is a cliche. People say, oh, it's like family, but the Plon community really is. Uh, and uh, we had this very sad uh, thing that happened, which uh, one of our Brazilian contributors died in a car crash. And we were at a sprint when that happened. And everybody was just crying their eyes out. It was, it was crazy. Like we, we felt like we lost a family member. And uh, so that evening we, at sunset, we 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 made caparinas. Uh, we were sitting in, in and just watching the sunset and talking about our memories of uh, Dornelis, which was one of the community members. And you know, classic family style where everybody just tells their amazing stories, uh, interactions of Dornelis, and all this stuff. And I think that's one of the times when I realized like how how close this community is. It's just everybody was grieving and. You know, it was, it's a sad story, but it just shows how close we are, so. Yeah, for sure. And actually the, the we lost, uh, honestly, the the, Plon, the Brazilian Plon community had two leaders that uh, no one questioned ever. Everyone else, uh, people would say, yeah, I don't like him and so on. But uh, these two people, Dornelis and Jean, they were so above everyone else and they were loved by everyone to the point that now they named the prize, the Python, the Brazilian Python community give yearly to people that uh, uh, are like the embodiment of the spirit of community. So they are remember every year. And of course, some of us remember more and more and uh, we have our moments of crying and so on. And uh, I would like to open for Q&A. I have one question that of course, 
uh, would come from uh, the Netherlands. It's Fred Van Dyke saying, oh, Limi, he's using you as consultant now. Limi, Plone moved now to single page application with a front end written in React. It was a big step for us. What do you think are going to be the next steps in terms of user experience and usability? Um, for Plone or the industry? Because I'm not... I'm you not, know that yeah. every time you say something, <laughs> Plone follows, so... Sure. Uh, no, I think uh, I was very happy to see that, you know, people are still working on modernizing. It goes back to the thing I, I mentioned that maybe you don't love React, but it's clearly here to stay, right? So Plone can't uh, cling on to its own a little corner of a technology when the rest of the world has moved to a different thing. So it's it, you have to be pragmatic and adopt those technologies when they come along. Um, so as far as user interface and those kind of things, I think it's always a pendulum, right? Like it started when we started, everything was server side rendered, and then now you have people that like don't understand that you know you have front end developers that don't understand that you can simply write a web page and serve it up from a server. Like they, they think everything needs to happen on the front end. So I think it's gonna go a little bit back again uh, in the sense that there are things that are better done on the server. Uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm not a technologist, so I don't think I can comment on, on that part as much. I think um, what's happened in the world in general with user interfaces and technology is very, good because you're all you all have phones in your pockets you grow up with like we we fought hard in the world from a designer perspective to get to this and i'm very happy that it happened because when when you know iphone and that, those kind of things came along as a designer it was like yeah finally you hit the reset button on how we interact with computers right like my my family is not allowed to to have anything else than ipads like i i refuse to support computers because you know they will they will call me up and be like where did my file go right and i'm like why do we have files in 2023 like that's an absurd notion so uh so i think the thing that happens kind of quietly is that everybody's gotten used to a much higher level of design and and usability and that people don't even think about it but i needed to explain all of this stuff 20 years ago to people and that's that's why plone happened it, it was the most user friendly open source, you know, CMS out there at the time. And the entire industry has leveled up on, on usability because they, they have to, right? So I think that's, that, that's going to continue. Um, I think the web is in a very bad place right now, uh, for multiple reasons, like advertising and all that stuff. But like, whenever I use the web, I'm, I'm very sad, especially having worked on Firefox for so many years, right? Like the web is now this like slightly dirty grimy place that has a lot of pop-up uh, things and overlays and stuff like that so uh i don't know it's it's one of those things I, I i hope we can take the web back a little bit uh because it is an open technology that is going to be around forever uh and while i praise these devices there's also problems with you know it's much harder to write an app than to write a website so uh it's one of those things that that needs to come back, and and with the explosion of Twitter and like the meltdown, I should say, um, I'm hoping we we decentralize everything a little bit more again. Uh, so this is not design related, but but I do hope that we can get away from these silos. And people have stopped using Facebook, and and you know are critical to. Not, I'm not in a camp where I think social media is bad because I think it's done a lot of good for you know families to share photos of their grandchildren and all that stuff. But uh, it it foments this very scary part too. So uh, the internet was better when we had a lot of small places together, and that's the same as the world, right? Like if you try to get everybody in the same location, bad stuff happens because people people can deal with. 100 people but they can't deal with thousands of people so um so on a high level design and i know that's not what he was asking but i but i hope we decentralize a little bit more and have these small communities uh just like we used to uh, because it's a lot healthier for for the world and for the web and for for open source and everything so we ran out of time, so uh, I invite everyone. We are going to have lunch after, and then the, yeah, the hour. So to yeah, it's the opportunity to talk to them and get free consultancy. <laughs> uh,
thank you both for coming. It was a pleasure having you. We should do that more often. And uh, please, a round of applause to them.